Okay, um, this is going to continue some of the themes um, that were um, in several of the talks, um, and I'm going to, in a minute, get to the apologies about what it's not going to do. Um, so let me see if I can do this. Do we need to do it from here? Oh, maybe just yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. There. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, something that a study that is starting um, and in the very early stages uh, called the Adolescent Parent Study or Ad Health PS to shorten it a bit. And what we're interested in this study is about relationships, intergenerational linkages, right? And I'm going to talk about I'm kind of using intergenerational linkages as a generic term for, in fact, the range from intergenerational correlations in phenomena between two generations and a family to, to essentially transmission from one generation to the next, um, which, which will, I'll give you some example. And, and the last one is the sort of generic term about gene or to cover um, relationships, where I'm going to be interested in thinking as in terms of uh, joint choices, exchanges, um, transfers between one another, dis uh, common decision making over or decision making involving one generation or the other. And we're interested in this in the context of measures about health and well-being. This starts out, as Ad Health <coughs> indicates, as a study about um, health. And I'll explain where that origin comes from in a minute. Um, we're going to be interested in those linkages primarily, and I'll define what I mean by primarily in just a little bit, primarily about the relationships between parents and their adult children. So we're going to kind of leave the realm of young children and their influence, and we're much more interested in, so you can think about the context we're most interested in are the period in which adult children have gone off, formed their own households, don't reside in the same locations as they're in, literally in the same household, they may be in a similar location, uh, but we're going to start thinking about the older generation who's about to retire and ultimately um, uh, get sick and die, um, and the younger generation who's going to worry about family formation, their own child-bearing child decisions, et cetera. So that's, that's the kind of place in the, in the life cycles of these two generations that we're interested in. Less about the young generation, we're moving towards the latter generation. This is funded by the National Institute of Aging, so um, they're interested in older people. And what we're doing here is leveraging an existing study, the adult health study, which I'll say more about in a, in a bit. Uh, it's in fact a nationally representative cohort of sample, age ranges started back in 1994, of kids who were at the time in, in junior high and high school, you can think of in the US context, and has a rich longitudinal data set. I'm going to distinguish. Some of you know Ad Health in a different context than the one I'm going to uh, focus on here today. But the part I'm particularly interested in is a longitudinal, repeated observations following these young, young uh, teenagers through till now at the most recent interview in 2008 uh, when they're in their uh, mid-30s um, and they're going to be continued on. And, and a lot of information and a lot of focus on, um, not in fact, less focus on economic data. Um, but a lot of focus on health-related data, data, genetic information, which I'll come to, um, and, and social context. Okay, presentation for today. Now the apologies. Um, I have no particular, there, I'm going to talk about sort of theoretical issues. I'm not going to talk about particular theories. Um, I'm not going to test particular theories. In fact, I have no data, um, other than the data that exists in the earlier generation, right? We just started this study, we literally um, um, the funding, um, I'll talk a little bit about pilot, but we have you know, we just got funding um, about a month and a half ago. So we're starting a design phase um, in this. So what I'm going to focus on then is really telling you about design, how we thought about this problem, that is why, what motivates it. Um, we're going to talk about what pairs of family, family members we're interested in, parent-child pairs, because there's some issues here that are kind of important. Um, what sort of data we're going to collect, again, at uh, 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000 feet, depending upon your perspective, it's going to be at fairly high level. And then I want to talk, if I get a chance, I may not because Marco's already covered part of this, right, how we think about what kinds of relationships or linkages we can study and what the different issues resolved in, you know, that, that arise in each one from sort of correlations which are fairly straightforward to 
estimate, aside from the, the richness of the types of things you want to get intergenerational correlations for, we think we can expand the set that we've had before. Uh, to you know, sort of more about this transmission, I'll talk a bit about the, the, the issue about measuring the, the nature versus um, environment, uh, what's in the context now become gene environment interactions. Um, and at the end, talk a little bit about um, uh, be more behavioral models. Okay, so there are three big domains that kind of motivated. So, the, you know, the question we had to answer to get this funded is why should we do this study? Um, and uh, so I'm going to give you our, our take. Um, they bought it, at least up to a point. Um, in three domains. So remember, this is a health study, and I, I apologize. I'm going to tell you a little bit later in a few minutes about what the study, um, actually, the Ad Health study does. But the three domains we're interested in are health and health related behaviors. Um, the second domain is going to be about uh, uh, cognition, uh, personality, and, and preferences. And the last domain is about intergenerational relationships, transfers, exchanges, et cetera. Okay, so let me start with health. The, the key thing here is there's a lot of data, a lot of studies sort of indicating in the domain of health that traits run in families, from birth weight to cardiovascular disease to obesity uh, to, to physical activity and overeating to substance abuse, be it alcohol uh, or, or, or other substances. And so we, we know that's true. That's been measured. This is in the realm of these intergenerational correlations with respect to health. Right? And we also know if you do, uh, if, at least in the United States, I don't know elsewhere, right? If you walk in to see a doctor, the first thing they do is they hand you a sheet of paper and say, tell us about the, your family history of various kind of health activities, right? And health conditions, right? What did your parents die from uh, if they're dead? What do they have? Um, and those turned out to, why do they do that? Because those turned out to be in a, just a purely predictive sense, right? Predictive of your, you know, you are in some ways, at least per, your health conditions are predicted by your parents' health conditions. Not perfectly, thank goodness, um, but, but pre predictive. Huh? Thank goodness, poor unfortunate. Yeah, that's true, that's true. <clears throat> Over drinks, I'll tell you a story about that, uh, in my own case. Um, so, and you know, we know something too about the, the domains of where these m linkages might be, right? Um, and, and they're complicated ones, right? In the sense of, uh, we know some of this is, a, you know, you, you, why, why are these correlations? Well, because of, your, you know, you, you share the genes uh, of, of, your, of your parents and, by the way, your siblings. You shared some of the environments, all the discussions about, again, remember this is 50,000 feet, about this parenting part and other facets. And you know, increasingly people are interested in the interactions between these two, that certain genetic conditions coupled with certain sort of you know, parenting practices or situations you were in your kid as a child, you know, abuse, maltreatment of the parent leads to um, outcomes of certain type in the next generation. Okay? Now, when you look at most data, so this is why do you want to do this study to, to add to what we already know, um, is it turns out much of the stuff that we do reports on the information about one, from the, the one generation is the source of information. So I tell you about what my parents' health histories were when I fill out that doctor's form, or in any of the data sets I tell you about the health uh, of, of my parents, right? And yet we know from various sources of studies that um, and this is something we're actually going to look at, but from other places, uh, you know, what you report and what your children report, um, or that's in my case, what your parents report um, uh, and, and their children report are different. Um, not only about their own situations, but as it turns out about their other situations. So this reporting issue, right, the second part of this whole thing is, the, 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 so the reporting issue is one generation and that has potential drawbacks and interesting features for the purposes of modeling, but in terms of actual health status, um, may have reporting error associated with it. The other part is that these are self-reports, and even if they are, you know, sort of objective, and so sometimes in a general survey they say, you know, your health conditions, and those are, um, um, mes you know, noisy measures of actual health conditions. Um, uh, we know uh, detailed information, again, about one generation but not the other. We may follow one generation in a, in a cohort study, right? We follow one generation across time, the NLSY, uh, 79 that's been talked about in several different uh, uh, papers and will be talked about again is exactly of that form, right? Parents were asked, were interviewed once in that study um, in the initial year. But we have a lot of reporting about their conditions, uh, very little about the last one. And then the third one, which is a con common issue in these health studies, right, where you have this wealth of health information is oftentimes these are clinically based. So I capture data by virtue of the fact that somebody came to a, you know, to, to either has a health condition 
So they have a cancer, and so we put you in a database, and we're going to monitor you, and we ask you some questions, or, or you're asked some questions about that condition. You might be captured because you went to a particular health facility. Um, but all of those are about, you know, sort of capturing that maybe condition, right, condition on certain types of outcomes or behaviors. Um, you know, substance abuse, we have people who, are, uh, who have problems with substance abuse. And yet, we're particularly interested in how representative these are in a broader population. Okay. Cognition, personality, and preferences. There's a lot of work about the role of cognition, you know, I IQ and other measures, about those being predictive of a range of different outcomes that, you know, have for a long time have, have interested uh, social scientists, right? And, but there's also growing evidence um, that um, the importance of, now you can use different terms here. I got in trouble, uh, gave this talk last week uh, over at U uh, University of North Carolina, I got in trouble about non-cognitive skills, so I'll let Flavio defend this. But there seems to be some, you know, other attributes then than uh, what is uh, cognitive, what I want to call cognitive ability, cognitive functioning with non-cognitive traits. We know this is true in a paper with Jim, that Jim has with Angela Duckworth, who's a member of this research team on personality traits from perseverance and conscientiousness playing this role of being predictive, and preferences, risk averse and impatience we talked about earlier in terms of predictive of these, some of these, some of these same behaviors, wages, educational attainment, et cetera, and as well other ones including personal finances, uh, work in the study that Bob Willis has been involved in for the last several years with several collaborators, COG Econ, um, marriage, divorce, et cetera. Okay, so again, why? Well, is this heritability uh, of these kind of traits? Is it about sort of the shared environment, broadly put shared environment here? And I always get, you know, stalled by this, con you know, this is about behaviors and um, it's not, you think of this notion of the external environment, that's not what's going on here, but it's a term of, of art here, both. And um, we know sort of fair, you know, sort of the questions here, what, what's the source, the explanation? How important are these in sort of understanding this role of intergenerational about the attainment of any generation, you know, either the older generation or the younger generation in terms of various types of outcomes? Um, how much of these are important in persistence of inequality, right? Um, we know about this early education part, right? The part that we know less about um, is sort of later things which happen with respect to outcomes, and I'll talk a bit more about it in, 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 uh, in a minute. Okay, so a lot of this business about measuring, you know, it's more complicated, not necessarily a lot more complicated to measure cognition, uh, although we can do it. We can measure sort of personality, the big five, ask a set of questions, right, to go to, you know, sort of preferences, but oftentimes we don't get all three. We don't get them together. We get studies, studies specialized, and that's going to be a tension in what I talk about here, right? We're going to be really interested in putting things together, and um, the part of the talk here is going to be, it's at a general level because we're going to try to put multiple things together. Um, but I would note, right, there's also a question about these person, the, the reliability of measuring preferences in social surveys, um, right? Um, uh, you know, a lot of the work has been done in sort of doing these in labs. There is some increasing work about how well surveys, what, what can you pick up about attributes like, you know, risk aversion, dimensions of risk aversion, what at least, you know, impatience and so forth in survey settings, right? Th that is where you don't have a lot of intervention, right? Um, versus, you know, quote, more laboratory. Um, and some work that Duncan Thomas um, really headed up that I a, 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 was a co-investigator on in Mexico, we, we, we're, we've tried to look at that. And there are differences. There are some things which do pretty well because we did it with both surveys and um, more laboratory settings. Yeah? One of the intriguing facts that I picked up somewhere from a CDC seminar was that uh, education seems to be a very good predictor of mobility, in fact, better than most standard Is the design here and this module of the um, uh, questionnaire helpful in terms or in terms of um, aim at unpacking that kind of uh, fact? Uh, or did I just misremember how that fact works? No, no, I mean, there's a, again, there's a correlation, right? A clear cut correlation between educational attainment and sort of these outcomes. And that's part of this. Right, rising inequality that comes in not just in economic outcomes but health outcomes as well. So yes, you are right. 
the question here is, and you know, are we going to completely unpack it? I doubt it. But we can sort of start to look at some of the sort of determinants of each, right? That sort of educational attainment of a generation and how those, if nothing else, how they affect and possibly mediate other types of phenomena like your genetic composition to affect sort of health outcomes. How much can people for, com compensate for, say, not so good genes in affecting sort of their later outcomes? And that kind of interaction of, you know, that kind of interaction of, of, of uh, use of, you know, for role of education has been found in other contexts as well. So, so I imagine one of the basic questions would be, um, does, does the status of the measure of like education, is it associated with health because it is in fact uh, uh, have good health, their health um, practices associated with education? That yeah, or how much of it's selection, right, or how much of it's selection, that's exactly right. I mean, and, you know, are we going to get at all of that? No, but I think we're going to be able to get at some of that. As I'll show you the data elements that we're going to have here, that we already have and will have, I, I think that'll help. Can yeah. some kind of, like, <coughs> I'm a little bit bored with all the, so many plans, so give me some, some, something to eat. <laughs> like, this idea, one of the things we know is that self-assessed education is, is absolutely fantastic predictor of, of mortality and it's a very good thing. And it has a lot of power for many things. But this idea has those things. That's right. Uh, it has it for some for some parts of it, yeah, it from some parts of the distribution. So what do we know so far? We know there's a correlation between education. Right, of course, even zero is a correlation, but what is it that the intergenerational? We, we, we know that education interacts with certain genes uh, to affect... Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I mean, you wanted the facts or not? I mean... Yeah, yeah, but don't do the facts. So what, which ones do you want then? We don't know much in the PSID about these other kinds of mechanisms because we don't gather a lot of information in the but PSID. The one we gather, which is the self-assessed health, what do we know about those? We know the educational correlation. Well, that they know very well. But what do we know about the I, I'm sorry, that, that, that's the full stop. Keep in mind the design of the PSID. So the PSID, do you want to, go ahead. I'm trying to say, do we know something about the self-assessed education between parents and, and kids? What's the correlation of those two numbers? Uh, the, the educational correlation is, is high between parents and, you know, I think it's something like 0.4 to 0.6, and there was a reference to it earlier, and that's about right. Health. Huh? Self-assessed health. Self health is um, weaker in, in terms of th those outcomes. Other data sets suggest that that may be higher. The selectivity of those samples matters. This is one of the issues that we're going to try to, we're going to, try to answer. Okay? We don't know that in part because we don't have it for a representative sample of sort of that intergenerational correlation and or it's reported by one party telling about the health of another, right? My father died of a heart attack, right? Every time I walk into a doctor's office, I fill out that form, they think I have coronary, you know, I'm a prime candidate for coronary heart disease and in one sense I am. It turned out because when I looked further, my father died because he had rheumatic fever when he was a child and his heart was scarred. So it's compromised as to what that outcome is. So this information, right, is problematic and we're gonna, we're gonna have some strategies for sort of dealing with the accuracy of this information that we collect. Okay, so I wanna talk about um, briefly family, uh, some of these family exchanges and transfers. Again, we know a good deal. There's a good deal of literature and here the PSID is I think particularly strong because it has asked a series of questions about transfers between generations in terms of financial and time transfers. For those of you who know the work, Altanji Hayashi and Kotlikoff's papers on this sort of are classics in the literature looking at family structure models, but they're classic because of the information that's provided about, um, uh, part by consumption, although that part's gotten better, but, but, by, but about financial and time transfers that are provided. And we just recently, you know, a separate project that I have not, not here, right, we just completed a survey in the PSID that re-asked the question that weren't asked since 1988 about those time and money transfers. And, and, and uh, I, I'm not gonna talk about that today, so but that we can talk about, huh? That it'll, be, it'll be available in about uh, 15 months, right? And you get the data as soon as we do. We, we get no um, exclusive use of the data. Yeah? Wouldn't it have been better to do this on ISO? Um, you'd, have, you'd have the whole genes for everyone. Uh, if, if, you were, of people, if you were only you interested, if you uh, a panel data set on all, uh, not everything, but you can from register, you can control. Um, but the point is, you have the genes 
And then you can ask some additional questions. How do they present that? That would be right. And you know, there's two answers to that. One, there are a broader set of questions here. This is the tension about sort of if I was only interested in sort of genetic transmission, I would be, I, I think I would probably agree with you, right? But one, I'm not, right? I'm interested, for example, in what happens in relationships between stepchildren for reasons that I'm going to come to in, in the next slide. Two, um, I, I had enough trouble getting funding for doing this on a U.S. population from the National Institute of Aging. Um, I think, uh, you know, it was, right now getting money on to doing Iceland would be uh, much more difficult. I'm being practical. Okay, so here's the deal, right? With respect to trans, <laughs> um, maybe there's the analog that yeah, in Iceland is willing to for, for, for finance it, but I think you want, given the, the financial situation, I want cash in advance, right? <laughs> huh? We also want to do it outside the fridge, where the social interactions are much more important. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, uh, in the sun, right? <laughs> um, so bottom line is, you know, we know a bunch about d d these, we know a good deal here. And this is a case where we know a lot about the interactions between uh, parents and their children, parents and their grandchildren. I'll come back and talk about it. And we know that this form of care sort of, you know, we know the incidents during the recession, right? One of the phenomena that uh, people like, uh, Kaplan, have, sort of uh, Greg Kaplan, have noted, right, and it's been documented well in, in census data, is there was this big increase in um, children, especially at, you know, sort of uh, early adult ch childhood, moving back to their parents' household if they ever moved out or staying, right, delaying sort of the time in which they went out. Um, and you see this in other contexts. You see this in Indonesia during a financial crisis where there was consolidation of households with families, right, move back in. Uh, with, with families uh, disproportionately. We know in the latter part that families play an important role in the caring for elderly, uh, you know, uh, with illnesses or, or physical disabilities, right? Um, the, uh, there's a study, it's now old, and we hope to sort of increase, you know, sort of replicate this, but the cost, trying to do an estimate of the cost provided by informal care by family members <laughs> is six times greater than the cost of nursing home care. And, uh, or probably two and a half times greater than nursing home care. And six times co more costly than uh, formal home daycare, home care that's provided for the elderly. So this is a huge you know, sort of expense. Now, related point, if you think about the, 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 the issue about, and this is why I want data on not just the genetic part, re g genetically linked directly to you know, think outcomes. Um, we know, if we think about the cost of the baby boom generation, I just told you informal care is gonna be crucial to, to, to providing that kind of health care if past data persists. But that generation who's retiring is the peak generation who've experienced divorce, right? Before it builds up and then actually, uh, as people like, you know, uh, uh, Wolfers and Stevenson have sort of documented, right, declines after that, right? This is a peak generation, the baby boom, who are going to experience, um, who are, are more likely to have stepchildren, right? So the question is, how much your step, your step is going to care for you when you get old, um, right? Um, and are they going to care for you in the same way as your biological um, children? Well, we certainly bias. Sure, we certainly do in this study because we're not going to pick up in this study sort of you know the information about um, sort of all these. Everybody in the older generation in the study that I'm going to tell you about has got to have a, ch a child or they're not going to be in this, in this study. Yes. And so th this is, you know, in the line, line I make is the representative of the sample is only from the younger generation. And in some sense, the only thing we're studying here is the, a, in, in terms of its representatives about the relationships, not the cost of, you know, what will be the cost of the generation who are childless, right? We can pick up the part that's, you know, you're, you're childless, but you have a stepchild sort of been doing this. But yeah, we have a, there, there's no doubt, we don't capture everything here. It, you know, HRS can sort of pick up some of that um, in this kind of context. Uh, okay, one more point, and then I want to, then, then I need to go on. So this, there's this whole literature about the role of con social connectedness or flip side loneliness, having real, again, correlations, some sense about, some people think they know about the mechanisms, on health outcomes from physical health to cognitive functioning to other aspects of health. If you know the work of John Cassiopo, who is a psychologist at the University of Chicago, he's written extensively um, on this and has a lot of, you know, sort of, a lot of clear-cut evidence about this. Again, if you're going to study this relationship, data on both sides of the transaction, if you will, is going to play a crucial role to be able to understand that. We need to know, um, you know, what one party is doing and what party, what the other party is doing and what 
what they report about that, because so that reporting may be crucial. And that's where we find a lot of di discrepancy between what two generations report on how much did you, how much contact did you have with your elderly parent, how much contact did you have with your ch adult child, and you get two different answers in places wh where, the, where you do this comparison. The PSID and some of the early NLS cohorts uh, <laughs> find that as well. That's a very partial view of that, because uh, right? you're just focusing on the kids' part, and this is, kids are probably only a small part of the social uh, so, so I make that I make that's exactly right. And one of the things that this study is not going to be able to do is this broader connection. Although the previous estimates suggest, in terms of at least some forms of care, the role you, you know your good friend doesn't come over and take care of you when you become disabled, um, and less less frequently than sort of um, you do at the earlier the earlier stages. And the connectedness may come in this form of, as you say, right, largely with your friends for those who don't have children. So. We're going to miss part of this, no doubt about it. We'll, we'll, you know, we're going to ask questions about this, but we're going to, be, we're, we, you know, we, one could think about the total friendship network, which would be a neat thing to do, but you know, realistically, we're not going to get at it directly by asking friends about those, those things. But we can do it for the family. All right. Um, so what does the PS, what does the Ad Health PS do? The Ad Health Parent Study. It leverages the existing Ad Health Study. So, so let me tell you a little bit about the Ad Health Study. Um, the Ad Health study consists of a sample of about 27,745 individuals at wave, uh, at wave one. Let me, let me give you a little bit more context about this. The Ad Health study was started in 1994. The sampling frame was taking schools in the United States, not just public ones, but private schools as well. So it drew a sample from schools. The original sample, right, actually went in and collected data on a lot of students, 100,000 students. Every state picked schools and they went in and asked questions of everybody in this age range or in this grade range, um, eighth grade to, to, to 12th grade. A lot of you who know the uh, use of the Ad Health, you know it in the context of network studies, right? Because this is the part where a very short questionnaire was asked of all the respondents in those schools, tell me about your uh, friendships, right? Nominate your first five, I think, uh, friendships to tell you about that. And it's been used extensively for studying those uh, sort of th those associations. That's not the part that I'm talking about, right? Because after that, a sample of about that 20,745 was drawn randomly from these schools to not take everybody from a school. There is an exception of so-called the saturation sample. There were 16 schools where all the kids in the age range were picked. That was a balance between larger schools and disproportionately smaller schools in terms of doing the study. But what's, what the part that I'm interested in is the part that's about following up on the, um, the, the students from these schools, this 27,000. And let me now go flip back to this design. Some interesting features about that. So there's a random sample that was taken of the kids in those schools. But when they encountered this kid, when they interviewed him, and they did an in-person interview with the kid at home, they asked, Did you have any, um, do, you, do you have any siblings who were in the same age range? If they did, those children are enrolled too. So there's a particularly large sample of siblings, including a large number of, of twins in this data um, that were self-nominated. Now, you know, the fact of the matter is that you know, these kids were wrong in some cases, so they, you know, so they elicited information which turned out not to be a, a, a you know, so there's an ex post ra rationalization. They said, yeah, I have a twin brother. Actually, not a twin brother. Um, this is what adolescents do. My wife was a former um, middle school teacher tells me. There was also, but so there's a genetic subsample, and that's crucial here because I'm going to talk about using those twins and sibs in, in, you know, in ways when I add the parents to be able to sort of get at some questions that go to this question about genetic, genetic, genetic transmission or use of a strategy of instrumental variables that's become to, re to refine a strategy that's been used in the literature that you play. And there was also an oversampling of minorities, right? Um, it turns out there's even more groups here. The, the survey organization that did this uh, made a mistake, and there's an oversampling of, of, of children who are adopted, which turns out to be really cool um, uh, for reasons I'll come to in a second. Okay, so um, we have an oversample of genetically linked respondents. We have an oversample of ethnic, racial, uh, and other minorities um, in terms of the data. Yeah, so I'm going to come back. I'm going to show you that. So, uh, where is the design? Here it is, sorry. Okay, so here's the design. For this people that they followed, right, over time, there are four waves of data that have been collected so far on these adolescent, then adolescents, now young adults in the Ad Health study. That's separate from the one we're doing here, right? Um, that's the 27, 20,745, 
And by wave four, there's 15,700 that were interviewed. Uh, everybody's at risk to be re-interviewed. There's a dropout of a certain group to be re-interviewed. So some of these people that were, uh, you know, leaving out a little bit of the 27,745, there's, there's, there's still going to be more. And there's a wave five that's currently in the, in the works to collect data on their, their information. There's some side parts of this whole thing. There was a partner study, but most important for our purposes, in the first wave, there was a parent survey, right? And so students who, uh, the respondents were, they were asked to provide a, a parent. Um, let's, no, wait, I gotta find it here. Now I don't see it. Maybe it's down farther, I think it's down farther. Um, so there were some 17,000 parents um, and mostly those were mothers, right? So the, the priority was if they went to, got a, to get a parent, they wanted to get the, the first the priority was biological mothers, a mother figure, um, and you'll see not everyone has mothers. That sample was largely asking questions of the parent about the child and some about the family context, right? Not a lot about the parent per se. Um, and that's gonna figure crucially when we sort of come back to sort of collect data. Pardon? Yes. I can link it to what? HRS? HRS? No. No, this has nothing, I mean, this, this, this is no, has no link, I mean, to my, unless by chance, and the chances are pretty low, there's no, nobody in this sample is in the HRS. It's not designed to, to link with HRS. So I have four waves of data, and this is some of the information that was collected. Um, one of the things you won't see a lot of, there's a lot of health stuff, a lot of stuff about health-related behaviors, functioning, um, uh, uh, priorities. This was designed by sociologists. Um, and they're good sociologists, but they didn't think much about, you know, asking questions about more economics types of information. So this is a factor that we're going to have to deal with, and I'll talk about it later. They asked a lot of stuff about biological measures, and including in wave four, there was a, 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 a half-hour collection of biospecimens from height, weight, circumference, standard stuff, an inventory of drugs that people were taking to cardiovascular measures. They took blood pressure, they drew blood, and took blood spots to do different types of protein. This was all in the field, quite innovative at the time it was done and provides a, a, you know, sort of an inordinate amount of data on health status, right, on outcomes for a representative population in the U.S. Two features that are of potential interest, because I'm going to come back to them, that come out of this wave four data. One, over a third of this young ad health generation, remember, they're in their mid-30s at the time they were surveyed, a third of them at that time were classified as being obese. The second part is a little less than that, about 28% of them were classi classified as having hypertension, right? A good predictor, a good marker for the prediction of cardiovascular disease at later ages. And those indicators, the indicators of hypertension for that age range, right, sort of exceeds any group that has been any previous cohort, right? So we're, the, you know, it's obviously linked to obesity, but sort of the consequences of this for later health outcomes are, are um, you know, casting fear in a lot of sort of healthcare providers in terms of that cost to that generation for cardiovascular disease. Yeah, John. Were the uh, full sips who weren't twins, were they generally really siblings? Yes, yes. I mean, we ascertained this afterwards. This is a comment that, that we, ra you know, rationalized with the, that were rationalized by the, with the parents in this wave one, right? And we have gene information. There's a really interesting little piece, yeah, there's a really interesting piece on this. There's a guy who's done some work on this by the name of Dalton Conley, he's a sociology at NYU where um, you actually ask questions, the parents were asked questions about what the, whether they thought their children were uh, dizygotic or monogizotic, you know, identical or non-identical twins, right? And they're wrong about uh, 30 some percent of the time uh, based on DNA information. Okay, so as I said, they already, they interviewed a parent. Here's with a table I wanted to show you. Oops. Uh, so, I said in wave one they interviewed a parent. There were, there were 20,745 uh, of them. Um, you know, the vast majority were biological moms. 72, almost 73% of them uh, were biological mothers, right, that provided the information. Some of them were biological dads. You can see the percentages here. Notice, there were some who did not have a parent who was interviewed, right? Sometimes this was, there was none. Um, sometimes this was because the, the person, the only person, that, the caretaker in the household was an aunt, a grandparent, um, uh, uh, in a foster home setting. And we're going to focus in what we're doing um, on, as it turns out, we're going to focus on the parents who were um, 
uh, biological or step parents. We're not going to focus on this other group, at least not, um, not in the first part of this. But I also want to note that the, the, this was the initial information. A key feature for our purposes in the last wave done in 2000 on the sample in 2008, they asked explicitly locating information for where this wave one parent was. They went by name and said, could you give us their address? Could you give us their phone number? If they would provide it, give, it, give us their email address. And we have that for 96% of the, the people who are asked. So that's key to us. It makes lowering the cost of getting the sample uh, particularly significant. Um, I make that point. I want to make one la last point and I'll come to in just a second. We're going to enroll these parents who are kind of in some sense easy right, in this analysis. That is the parents who were, who, who, for whom we have locating information. But we're obviously worried that we're missing a subset of the parents. Um, most notably, we're missing the parents who weren't around in 1994 when this interview took place and indeed may never have been around. So think uh, in the parlance, absent dads. Um, who weren't there. So the question is, if you're interested in this genetic part of the story, right, you would really like to have the information on those parents. There, I guess, the, Ice, you know, the Iceland data would be, be helpful. So we have a sub-project I'll talk, talk about in just a second, in which we're actually seeing, can we go find those absent dads? Okay, here's what the survey, so first part of this study, what we call phase one, um, we're gonna, we have funding to pick up to survey 4,600 parents. That corresponds, by our estimates at least, to the parents of about 3,282 um, ad health respondents, right? We predict that we'll find, you know, 60% six, of the time there'll be a, uh, when we interview this wave one parent, right, typically a mother sitting next to her will, or in the same household will be a, a father who was either the biological father or the stepfather at the time the, serve, the study was done back in 1994. We're gonna administer a 60 minute interview to each one of them. Um, we're going to collect biospecimens. We're going to essentially, in these cases, first and foremost, repeat a lot of stuff that was ca captured for the, for the younger generation. Cognitive functioning, the big five personality traits, uh, plus some other stuff which I'm going to talk about if I have time at the end about relationships between them. And we're going to collect, with some age adjustments for, for the, their ages, we're going to collect biospecimens. Indeed, we're going to do a better job of collecting biospecimens. We're going to, collect, uh, we're going to take venous uh, blood draws. And that will, is going to allow us to look at a much wider range and more accurate range of health, con you know, health conditions, um, including issues about epigenetics, which um, I don't know very much about, and probably everybody in the room knows a lot more than I do, but um, that's cool uh, in some circles. Uh, that'll get funded, let me put it that way. Um, but the other piece is, I mentioned before, we've got this problem, which is m these parents, at most, they've been, they were interviewed in 1984, and we didn't ask much about, of them to begin with. Two, there's this other parent that we we're going to try to collect data on. We know nothing about their past history. So it's a little daunting to walk in the room and say, tell us about your you know, first 60 years of life, that is, from you know, birth till today. Um, we're not going to, we have some real constraints. There are places, though, in which we can get information about them, we can go, for example, to get some information about their earnings histories from Social Security Administration links, and we, we are in the process of doing that and have a, a preliminary approval of that. If they're retired, we can get two things. One, we can get the benefits that they're receiving from um, so Social Security, so we'll know those income sources. And we can also get their Medicare health records. And those give us diagnostic codes for knowing what their health conditions are at this, at this stage. And what, what the survey is about is getting permissions to do that because the good news is for these kind of studies, news to me when I started this, is you can actually get permissions to prospectively add that data going time. It's a relatively recent change. Is that permission from the Respondent. Or? Oh. Yeah, from, from the parents, right? They, they, we ask them, can we, can we access your Social Security records? Can we access your Medicare records? Once we have that permission, we can access them not only then for their past history, but going forward in principle to their diet, which is kind of nice, right? Because in the current climate, being able to know that you're going to get another wave of surveying done while we wish we j desperately want, so, you know, want is uh, you know, dicey at this point. Okay. Um, there's a pilot that we're doing I mentioned before. We're trying to find these parents and that we, you know, the absent parents in particular. And we have a pilot study of about 300 cases where we're doing this intensive uh, two-year study to say, can we, given all the things, you know, when you look out there and you say, I can find anybody on the internet. Jim Smith, uh, when he reacted to this, said, just turn a bunch of undergraduates loose and they'll be able to find all these people, no, no sweat. Well, that would be nice and I wish we could, but indeed you can't follow protocols like that and get away with it. 
Um, but we haven't, we're working with an organization, RTI International, that does surveys. They're trying to find these people. There are a lot of sources of information that you can tap to sort of find people. It's a challenge here because the, P, the Ad Health study was started in a period in which it was focused on adolescent health, I said. Right? That name masked the fact that it was focused a lot on sexual practice of adolescents, right? That kept, you know, collecting information on partners was not just for who your friends were, but sort of who some of your you know, sexual relationships were with and what actions you, did you take. And um, long story short, it had a rocky start um, because of concerns in Congress about um, what, you know, what was being collected in this survey. So as a consequence, right, they kept none of the information, like names of parents, except for that wave one parent. So we go in our, so when you got, talk to a survey organization, they say, well, can you give us the social security number? No. Can you give them their name? No. The only thing we know is they lived in an address back in 1994. And for some of these parents who were absent dads from the start, we don't even know that. So there's a challenge to going about doing this. Um, and, and we're in the process of seeing, you know, not just about how many we can find, because we know we won't find them all, but who can we find, because we'll know the representatives of that sample, and two, um, how costly is it to find them? Um, you know, how much do you, resources do you, do you have to expend to be able to find sort of the, the, out, you know, the worst cases in this thing to, to, uh, us to, to go further? Um, how many of them could you find by asking the parent or the child? So we are asking the parent. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, th there, there's an interesting set of concerns, right, about the fact that um, a lot of concerns about finding these absent parents are related to the fact that if they're estranged, right, and, and or there was abuse in the history, et cetera, right, they won't tell you about this, right? And so we have to be very careful how we pose these questions as to, and remember, we don't know who they are, so we're kind of probing here to find out. In some cases, they don't take the case of a truly absent father. I don't know who my father is. Um, uh, so we're, 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 we are going to ask, the, we're going to ask the, that parent that we do have data on, and we're going to ask the respondent themselves to provide us this information. But we have to be careful about it. Um, and we, furthermore, we don't want to cut off, don't go after him, right? Because we don't want this message from one parent or the other saying, I don't want you to try to find my father or my ex-husband or the father of my, of my son. Because um, it puts us in, you know, ethically in a very compromised position. So writing this questionnaire, I never thought this was so difficult, but it turns out to be a real so, pain. Uh, about the uh, mentality of the parent in interview one, so how many, what is the fraction of them that is still, still around? Um, based on of, that, of this wave one parent, um, something like, I want to say, 91% um, of them claim they're still alive um, in, the, uh, in 2008, the last time we know. Okay. Um, there are two other pieces. I won't bore you with it. We're going to go get those parents of those genetically linked subsamples. We've got part of them in the random sample that we took for the Ad Health study. We're going to go get all of them because they're extraordinarily valuable, valuable for these purposes. And there, we're really interested in going out and getting the absent parents as well. We'd like biological parents, but we also want the step parents in these cases because they provide some interesting sources of variation. Um, we're going to go get ethnic and groups. Again, in the literature about gene environment interactions, what's called in this literature, everybody has different names for this, right? The, the population admixture, otherwise population heterogeneity, right, are a, sort of a key issue, and we want those sub sizable samples for those subgroups. Okay. Uh, oh, la one last study that, that, that we're piloting right now. Um, just, just, just got funding, as of, I just got an email today. Um, uh, the, we've, we've got a study in which we're using um, Mobile technologies, so think cell phones and apps that you can get where you can actually get cortisol readings for somebody through, your, through a cell phone app. This stuff is like Star Wars, right? But really cool, where we're gonna actually go use this. People have used this, it's not an uncommon technology, increasingly for interest in health use, you know, sort of monitoring health. We wanna do it to actually study relationships, right? We wanna see whether you can do this. That is, can I ask questions? When I want to find out about social connectedness, the normal sort of course in a survey is to say, you know, did you contact your parents in the last week, or maybe you did it over the last month? How many times, how many hours? And I have no, well, unfortunately my parents are both dead, but um, uh, my, I, I can tell you from my wife, because she talks to her mother every day, but most of us, I suspect, you know, would have a harder time answering that question, you know, being very precise about it. So we want to do this in real time, right? And we want to ask the questions. And we also want to, while we're asking, ask, okay, so, 
how, do, do, you know, do, 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 if you're doing something, are you doing something for your parent? Are you helping them with something? And again, much of this is done in the context of caregivers who are physically living proximate to or even with their parents, but there's an awful lot of stuff that goes on that doesn't require you to live very close to your parent um, to be able to, to, to be involved in their lives. And, and again, the question is, how important is that as, as the, these moment-to-moment -moment sort of relationships people have suggested are important in terms of this relationship about morbi morbidity um, and mortality outcomes, but we don't know that much about the relationship. Now, granted, this may be about other friends that are much more important, and we acknowledge that possibility, but at least we can do it for one that, whether friend or foe, you're linked with this person, um, you know, at least in principle, over a long period of time. So we've got a study where we're doing that. Um, there's some interesting stuff about this. Um, this involves stuff that's not only for the Ad Health and Ad Health Parent Study, but the Dunedin Study, for those of you who know um, of, of or know the, the work of um, Terry Moffat and Absalom Caspi. Uh, the Dunedin Study is a study that they've been involved in for some uh, 30 years. Okay, in mind, how much time I got left? Five minutes, okay. I'm gonna do this quickly, and I'm not gonna get to the last part. Um, I wanna just talk about um, strategies for understanding intergener inter intergenerational oh. linkages. And I mentioned there were three. What? Correlate, intergenerational correlations, intergenerational transmission, and intergenerational exchanges and relationships. The intergenerational correlations, what can we do here in this study? Um, and, and how can we go about doing it? Well, here is pretty much measure on two generations, a a possibly a broader range of phenomena from health to behaviors to attainment for two generations. In principle, you could do this in other data sets, except for PSID, for example, has made a decision to not do anything more than self-assessed health measures, right? Um, so we're going to be ahead of the, sort of that two generationals by asking these and being able to do correlations. And look at the range of phenomena. How similar are the correlations between educational attainment, health outcomes, cardiovascular, you know, sort of these, some of these ca cardiovascular markers uh, for the two generations? What's, this, what's the relationship? How does it relate to education in terms of the earlier question that, was, that John raised, right, to be able to do that? Um, Associations at this point, right? That's all this is about. But the goal here is to be able to do a richer set. Cognitive processing. One of the things that, you know, is, is a, a question here is two things. One, how much do you know about the cognitive processing of your parents? It turns out if you look at sort of the way um, the clinical diagnosis for Alzheimer's or dementia are all clinically based. They never ask another family member. Maybe that's with good justification. Maybe the family member has no clue, right? But What's not so clear is how much do they know about one another, and I'll come to that part, but more generally, how much can you predict a younger generation's you know, sort of cognitive processing um, by what their parents are doing, even before their parents reach, say, a clinical diagnosis of dementia, maybe they never do, but their cognitive processing declines. So can you learn something about the rate of decline from predictions from previous generations? That's not causation, that's simply a correlation, but in the spirit of where a lot of medical health is in trying to understand those correlations as you know, markers in the same sense as health histories, this is potentially useful information. Okay, so maybe. Um, the, the whole part about intergenerational mechanisms for transmission of, you know, um, is, is a lot more complicated than just measuring the correlations. So if you, for example, want to know what's the effect of some health outcome, like uh, being obese, in one generation on their labor market outcomes wages, and that's a, some, a study that um, has been done in this particular case, right? Well, in principle, we have data on, as many studies have data on, in we'll single generation, we know what their weight is, it may be self-reported, we have accurate measures of what their weight is, we know what their wage outcomes are, can sort of collect that information. Um, and you could get to, you know, sort of looking at, as is of interest here, you know, what's the role of genetics, what's the role of, quote, parenting factors, what's the interaction between those two. But this is a standard issue here, right, about, again, separate name, confounding, but it's just a you know, standard admitted variable bias and or reverse causality um, that can play a role, right? In this particular case, um, your poor outcomes in the labor market may sort of impact your weight, right, and ultimately your, um, your, your status of obesity. There's been a lot of interest of late in certain quarters, especially in the epidemiological literature, but by economists as well, of using genetic variation across and within families as a source of, um, as an instrumental variable for identifying, say, these effects of health status on outcomes, so obesity on wages. 
um, uh, sort of health on educational attainment um, with respect to um, a range of different outcomes. And the standard issue here, right, is here, how does this work? Well, you, first of all, you have data, which we have, on a single generation in ad health, and a number of these studies have been done using ad health, genetic markers. And typically what you'd like to have is some you know, reason from a biological or at least from association studies that suggest some genetic markers are predictive of certain types of outcomes. So, you know, neurotransponders, dopamine, serotonin, um, are related to certain um, behaviors, right? Um, overeating, et cetera, um, uh, in terms of sort of these outcomes. That's the relevant conditions. And then the Mendel part, right? Back, if you remember, biology, Mendel, the, I believe he was a monk, um, right, had this theory that said basically, you know, at conception, right, you get, randomly you've got the genes of each of your parents, your mo mother and father, and you randomly get one or the other. So there's this randomization at conception um, in terms of the outcomes. Well, that's not related to anything, so the story goes, so we kind of meet the exclusion restriction. So this set of using of biological markers, these genetic markers for studying, say, obesity on the effects on wages and other studies, and here are a series of papers which have used that strategy. There's a refinement of this strategy, I'll finish in just a second, um, which is about um, refining that, which are called genetic lotteries. This is a paper, a recent paper by uh, Fletcher and Lehrer, which says, oh, well, wait a minute, you still have this common environment, so let's use twins, again, using ad health, to sort of take out sort of common factors so to refine. Why is it that twins don't have exactly the same outcomes? Well, it's because they had a different common environment. To the extent to which you can use the fixed effects of a family fixed effect to sort of take that out, you can refine this kind of uh, outcome. I'll st stop at this slide. So the important limitations to this, there are good on a lot of reasons that we actually don't know enough to know this, that the relevance condition is met, that we don't actually know that much about the mechanisms. And sometimes the basis for these mechanisms are done on very select samples, so they're compromised in terms of being facts that we can sort of go to bat with. And secondly, it turns out Mendel wasn't quite right, right? Indeed, there isn't sort of allele by allele randomization, right? So in fact, there's kind of clumps, right, of SNPs and information that's gone. And to the extent to which those control different things which are indeed correlated, right, essentially we have, uh, a, 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 an instrument which doesn't meet the standard exclusion restriction in that sense, um, there's, there's bias here. So what we plan to do here is parents though, if we know the genetic composition of the parents, we can start to refine those measures of IV, the IV strategy, or at least can assess the validity. For example, in terms of certain quote bad genes or outcomes with respect to sort of the, these transponders, right, one parent or the other had to carry it. So we'll know certain things by knowing if neither, you know, sort of the status of well, did both parents have it or did only one parent have it by knowing the data on biological parents. This is why getting biological parents is so important. Now you might say that's just about health stuff, but again, the, the, it, you know, the question is whether you can use this kind of genetic as an instrument, to, genetic kind of strategy to, as an instrument to sort of look at other types of behaviors. I have a whole set of other slides about you know, sort of the inter interactions. I will um, stop here. Marco has sort of talked about some of the thoughts we're having, which is very much about Expectations about one party or the other. How much do you know about your parents? Question I've asked people now in my common question. How much do you know if your parents are still alive? How much do your dad make? I had no clue. And I don't think my son knows what I make, right? And as we move forward, what, how much do parents, you know, one party or the other know about the health status? That is, the assumption that's commonly made in the context of intra-household, um, right, uh, models of this kind of common information may not be true um, when we separate, we go our separate ways, we live in separate households, and about phenomena like, um, uh, you know, sort of income, health, et cetera. There may be good reasons why strategically you don't want to let your kids know or your kids don't want to know, let you know how much it's not, you know, how poorly it's going. And so we want to try to see if we can elicit information about those two parties, determine whether or not it's truly private information, and that's kind of not the easiest thing to do, to use as identifying variation um, in these kind of thinks that the principal agent context or the context of more general sort of games. Let me stop there.